going to be lecture 10. You saw there I've got us an example to start us out. Just one more closed system example. Lecture 10. Again, we'll start with an example here. Page 1. Got the timer going. We are ready to go. We've got a weighted piston containing nitrogen at 600 Kelvin heated to a thousand Kelvin. Determine the heat supplied to the nitrogen. Okay. So again, normally a good idea to draw your system. There's a good chance you're probably going to have to draw or write up a first law equation. So if you already have your system drawn, it's a whole lot easier to write your first law equation. They've given us some information. They've told us it's nitrogen gas. I'm just going to write it. Nitrogen, of course, is a diatomic substance. So we'll write that as N2. Uh, it's going to start at 600 kelvins, and it's going to finish at 1,000 kelvins. So it goes through a heating process. They have told me not a whole lot else. Right? Is there anything else that's given there? Something I've not put down. Are there any adjectives there that are important? Yes. What does that mean? What does weighted mean? We talked about that. This text likes to tell us, likes to use that adjective, weighted, to tell us that there's a constant weight or a constant force being applied to this piston that causes a constant force applied here, spread out across an area, causing a constant pressure. Okay, uh, and what are we looking for? They want you to find the heat. Going from a lower to a higher temperature, most likely that is heat added. Not, not always. I mean, there's some rare exceptions where that's not the case, but this is, I think they said, they, they actually said determine the heat supplied to the nitrogen. So they want you to find the heat in. Okay, so again, standard procedure is um, what, uh, what are some good tools that we have to find heat? Because we've identified what we're looking for, we've identified what we know, and then we say, all right, what are some good tools, laws, equations, expressions that I can use to try to get me to a solution? Well, again, first law is a good tool to find any unknown energy. Um, in this case, heat is an unknown energy. So I have heat going into the system. So to write my first law equation, draw your system, draw any energies going into or out of the system, and that becomes your entire left-hand side of your first law equation. Now, am I missing anything? Are there any other energies here? Pause it if you need to. There is. There is another energy here. Any time you have a piston cylinder, unless something stops the piston from expanding or contracting, the volume is going to change. Anytime the volume changes, you have a boundary work term. And again, we'll compute that in the out direction. So I've got a boundary work in the out direction we need to compute. Um, I don't see anything else applying a force or doing any other kind of work. There's no electricity. So this is a common types of work we might encounter is electricity, something applying a force, or a boundary work term. Well, we do have a boundary work term. Again, I'm looking for the heat in. That means I'm not going to worry about the heat out. We'll just find the Q net in. So that's in minus the out, and that equals the change. What is the type of energy that will change for this system? Well, it could be kinetic, potential, or internal. It's a stationary piston. Yes, the lid moves up and down, but that doesn't mean it's really changing significantly its potential energy. It's just um, the internal energy is the main driving energy change here. So this is kind of a stereotypical traditional thermodynamics problem. The whole goal of thermodynamics is to put heat into a substance to try to get work out. Right. So uh, I'm looking for the heat. I've got one equation here. That means I can only solve for one unknown. I'm looking for the heat. Um, 
I don't know the boundary work, I don't know the mass, and I don't know the internal energies. But I do know I've got an ideal gas. And we said last time, an ideal gas, the U values are going to be functions of temperature. So I could go look up the U values, or I could just say, well, that's, uh, well, let's, we could also use the specific heat. Okay. So let's do this, though. Let's, let's talk about that boundary work. So we know that's an unknown we're going to have to quantify. How do we find the boundary work? Well, we integrate from the initial to the final volume, pressure with respect to volume. And again, we've said if the mass is constant, here it is, you can factor that mass out of the integral. And you can just integrate with respect to specific volume. Now, what do we know about the pressure? How, do we, how does pressure vary as a function of volume. That's what we've got to do to be able to perform this integral. We need to know how does pressure vary as a function of volume. Well, they told us in the problem statement that's a weighted piston. Okay. Now write this somewhere, right? Let us know why are you doing this. Okay. Because if you don't tell me this, you know, <laughs> if you don't tell me um, you understand why that's the case. Well, I don't know. If you put it in the wrong place, you're going to lose points for it either way, whether you tell me that's why you're doing it or not. Just make sure you know why you're using this expression. This expression doesn't always work for boundary work. It only works in constant pressure situations. Okay? And again, you can see the calculus here to, to show that. So, if I substitute that in, Qn is equal to m delta u plus this boundary work, which I'm going to call M P delta V. And notice something really magic happens here. I've got a common mass there. Right? So a common mass, and I'm going to group these kind of interestingly. I'm going to I'm going to distribute the pressure here. So U2 plus PV2 minus U1 minus PV1. And maybe you see what I'm doing here. By definition of enthalpy, enthalpy is the sum of the internal energy plus the product of pressure times volume. So in this case, because of this and this, we can say this. And we can say, well, we can approximate that as C sub P average times T2 minus T1. Now, this, there's something really, really important happened here. And we're going to come back. We're going to go ahead and finish this problem. But we're going to come back and talk about why this is the case. Okay, and, and when we can do this, because we can't do this except for this very special case. Okay, so we're really going to revisit this in just a second. But let's go ahead and finish this problem out. Okay, all right. So um, I don't know the mass. I do know the temperatures, meaning I can go find the average temperature and therefore C sub P average. But I don't know the mass. If mass is not no, or findable. Right, so what would be a good way we could find the mass of an ideal gas, ideal gas law? If I knew the volume and or the pressure, maybe I could try to find it. So if it's findable or if it's, if it's not known and it's not findable, I've got no way to get to it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work per unit mass, per unit m. Okay. What that means is I'm going to say that little qn, that is big Q divided by mass. Remember, if I have something per unit mass, I can represent it with a lowercase variable. Little qn is simply equal to the change in enthalpy 
which again we can approximate as C sub P at the average temperature times the change in temperature. Okay. And again, if, if they want to know, if we want to know how much heat, total heat, right, so big U is what we call total heat, this is heat per unit mass or specific heat, well, it's not specific heat, let's not call it that. This is heat per unit mass. If they wanted total heat, they needed to give us the mass or some way to find it. That was not actually in the original problem statement. So this is kind of the best we can do, given the circumstances. So, what do we do here? Well, I need C sub P average. I have no temperatures. We've said I don't know the mass. We're just going to solve around it. So, that means I need... Based on properties, the fact that it's nitrogen gas and compute the average temperature. This one I can do in my head. Uh, this is 1,000 plus 600. That's 1,600 divided by 2. That's 800 kelvins. And so that's going to be enough information for me to find my C C P average. Let me grab my text over here. Oh, I had an ancient laptop on my desk, but I decided to move. Just was taking up space. I don't know. I'll play with my layout here. I'm, I apologize, I'm babbling to fill the dead space while I look in my tables for table A2. Chengel and Bowles text. Metric units. C sub P at various temperatures. Nitrogen down here. These temperatures are in Kelvins. Nitrogen down here. 800 Kelvin, two rows up from the bottom. C sub P is here. 1.121. 1.121. Would be the C sub P at 800 Kelvin. 1.121. That is energy per mass per temperature. Kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin in the metric set. Okay. Hmm. Heat N per unit mass, little q, is equal to that specific heat, 1.121 kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, multiplied by a difference between 1,600, both of those Kelvins. This is uh, 400 times this value. That looks like 4, 4, 8, 4, and the point goes, move it 1, 2 times, 4, 4, 8.4 kilojoules per kilogram. And again, if we had a way to get to the mass, if we could figure out a way to get to the mass, or if it was given, go ahead and multiply them by the mass. But in the absence thereof, I think that's the best we're going to be able to do. Okay. Now, I said back here, we did something really, really important. We said Q, instead of using U's, we're going to use H's. Why? That's really important. We never use H's for a closed system except when we know we can or when we know we need to. This is a special case. And this is a very special case. Now, this is a very common special case. We see this one a lot. But this is a special case. I double F. We call that if and only if. P is constant. If and only if P is constant. Then M delta U plus the boundary work out is equal to M delta A. If you put M delta H in, in your um, answers for a closed system, unless you explain to me why you understand that you're using H's and not U's, I will mark it wrong. It's not going to be a lot wrong, but you will lose some points. You do not use H's in a closed system unless there's a very special case. And this is a special case. Okay? If you have questions, let me know. Um, but that ought to get us started down this path, and that pretty well finishes out Chapter 4 homework.